Breaking news out of Towson. A man is shot near the Towson Circle. What we know about this incident and what seems to be an increase in crime in Baltimore County. What on earth is going on in our airspace? I'm Christine Frizzell with a look at some mounting questions about unidentified flying objects and some new political fallout. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 News at 10. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Bubala. And I'm Kai Jackson. We begin with breaking news out of Baltimore County. Police say someone was shot in Towson. It happened near the intersection of West Towson Town Boulevard and Washington Avenue near the Towson Circle and the Towson Town Center just after 7. Now, police aren't giving much information at this time, just saying a male was hurt. Police have not said how old the victim is or what led up to the shooting. As Fox 45's Vincent Hill reports, it's just the latest shooting to happen in Towson. Baltimore County Police right now only saying that a male was shot and taken to a local hospital. We don't know that person's condition. However, we do know that they blocked off several streets to determine exactly where that crime scene is. Tonight, shooting the latest in a rise in crime in Baltimore County that has county leaders sounding the alarm. Citizens have had enough. Delegate Kathy Slega telling Fox 45 she's worried the county's crime could soon resemble the city. We have an escalation in murders in Baltimore County. A 24-year-old Towson man shot and killed in November in Baltimore County police responding to a shooting last month near Joppa Road. Felons using firearms, and, and that's where the crimes are happening. Tonight, shooting in Towson, just around the corner from where Quancy Davis is accused of holding three victims at gunpoint and sexually assaulting them. And just down the street from Towson Town Center, where this disturbance happened last month. Fox 45 reached out to County Executive Johnny Olszewski for comment tonight, but he didn't reply. However, we pressed him earlier this month on crime in Towson and Baltimore County. I'm always concerned about the safety and well-being of the residents of Baltimore County. It's one of the most sacred responsibilities that we have. Delegate Salega says it's time to take that responsibility to the next level. Time, time is up. We really have to change course. Meanwhile, we'll continue the work to find out the identity of the victim in tonight's shooting, and we'll update you on air and at foxbaltimore.com. In Towson, Vincent Hill, Fox 45 News. Now, Towson has seen a number of violent incidents recently. Two weeks ago, police say someone fired shots near Towson Town Circle. No one was hurt. Early this month, police say a suspect committed an armed carjacking at Lock Raven Boulevard and Joppa Road. And as Vincent mentioned, at the end of December, seven juveniles were arrested after a large and chaotic crowd formed at Towson Circle. Meanwhile, a Baltimore County police officer still recovering at shock trauma tonight after a more than 36 hour manhunt spanning two counties. The department gave an update on his condition tonight. We'll bring you the latest coming up in just a few minutes. Turning now to the dire situation in some Baltimore City public schools and continuing coverage of a Project Baltimore investigation. The report shows 23 Baltimore City schools had zero students proficient in math. Now that's 2,000 students falling short of state standards on their most recent exams. Now, Fox 45's Maxine Stryker spoke with civil rights attorney and former HUD secretary Ben Carson about the findings. We'll hear from them coming up in just a few minutes. Our team coverage begins with Project Baltimore's Chris Papps and why this news was not a surprise to many Baltimore City parents. I represent the Black Church of Baltimore. We're acting right now. A community meeting erupting in anger and frustration this week after a Project Baltimore report. Zero percent. What are you preparing these kids for? Project Baltimore combed through the 2022 state test results known as MCAP. In 23 Baltimore City schools, there were zero students who tested proficient in math. City schools explained in a statement the steps is taking to improve math scores. The district said it's confident these steps will work. Michelle Watkins is not. How was he supposed to be productive? If he can't read. How was this um, pretty good. Watkins' son is in fourth grade at Johnston Square Elementary, one of the schools on the list of 23. Look around. I'm in public housing. I can't afford no thousand dollar tutor from Sylvan, but that's what he needs a tutor. Baltimore City funds nearly 20% of city schools' budget. 
this year, that amount hit $309 million. So Project Baltimore sent an email to Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. He did not respond. As a mother of children who go to one of these 23 schools, do you want to hear from the mayor? No, not really. I don't. Because what is he going to say? What is he going to do? I need somebody that's going to do something. Coming up on Monday, we'll show you which Baltimore County schools had zero students proficient in math and what else we found in the data that is simply stunning. I'm Chris Pabst and this is Project Baltimore. As you can imagine, this report is getting a lot of attention on our social media pages. Let's see what some people are saying. One person here says it's a very serious and concerning problem that the youth in Baltimore are not getting an education. This could be a reason they commit crimes. Here is someone saying the nation's highest per pupil cost isn't helping those math scores. Here, need an audit of where the money is going. This is something we heard a great deal from parents. And one more here. Uh, Becca says the more money they put in the schools, the worse they get. Well, Kai, civil rights attorney Ben Crump and former HUD secretary Ben Carson weighing in on the findings as well. They're frustrated with the inaction from city and school leaders. Fox 45's Maxine Stryker continues our team coverage. The calls for action are growing louder. He can't read. He's in the fourth grade. How is he supposed to be productive if he can't read? As parents are left feeling hopeless about their children's future in Baltimore City Schools. Nothing up there for them. Nothing. This week, Project Baltimore exposed 23 Baltimore City Schools that have zero students proficient in math. That's 2,000 students total. The results of the latest Project Baltimore study are very, very alarming. It underscores the reason why we have to go forward with this lawsuit to try to hold people accountable and make them come to the table to deal with this issue. We can't look the other way with such dismal test results. Prominent civil rights attorney Ben Crump says city schools have been looking the other way for far too long. I think without a quality education, then children are already imprisoned in this society today. They just have not slammed the jail cell door. And so if we want to prevent many, many children from being caught in the school, the prison pipeline, then we must act now. Last year, Crump joined a lawsuit against city schools, which accuses the school system of wasting taxpayer dollars and failing to provide an adequate education to generations of students. You're very familiar, obviously, with the performance of Baltimore City Schools and our reporting and the lawsuit. Do you think this is a crisis moment hearing hearing this latest news? I think that any time a, a young person is denied uh, quality education, it represents a crisis. And so what we have to do is look at the situation for what it is. We have to say we are failing our children and we have to take the responsibility to do better. Baltimore City funds nearly 20% of city schools. This year, that amount hit $309 million. So we asked Mayor Brandon Scott, do you believe a change in school leadership is necessary in Baltimore? And how do you defend these results? We never heard back. And in Annapolis, the topic received a similar response. I sent you an email about the 23 schools in Baltimore City who have zero students who are proficient when in math. you do a score, school story about something succeeding in the schools, I, I'll respond. You never do. So who do you hold accountable for the failing? Your boss. Your boss is for the distorted coverage you provided. Well, the data Baltimore. came from Baltimore City Public Schools. Do you think that uh, elected leaders in Baltimore City are, are turning a blind eye to African-American youth in city schools? I don't want to believe the uh, school leadership is turning a blind eye, but I do think that they may be arrogant if they refuse to sit down with community stakeholders. Your whole purpose for being is to make sure our children receive a quality education. And if you're not fulfilling your duties, then the people need to show up at the polls and make sure they 
hold them accountable. Dr. Ben Carson, who wrote the book Crisis in the Classroom with Crump, echoes a similar sentiment, saying new leaders may just be the answer. The solution is to get somebody uh, in charge who cares. Because this, <clears throat> let, let me put it this way. If it was their child and their child was in this system and there was a responsibility for educating a child, I guarantee you, you would see different results. In Baltimore, Maxine Stryker, Fox 45 News. Now, a statement from Baltimore City Schools claims a plan is in place to help boost test scores. That includes professional development, summer learning, and extended learning times at the end of the school day. And this report is just the latest problem Project Baltimore has reported on. In 2021, they discovered so-called ghost students and grade changing at Augusta Fell Savage High School, which is one of the 23 schools with zero students scoring proficient on the state math test. Last summer, Project Baltimore heard from five families who say their children with disabilities were forced to miss significant amounts of class time, but their report cards showed fake grades and attendance. Now, despite those problems, Dr. Sam Lisa's salary is rising. She earns a base salary of more than $300,000 per year. Project Baltimore found with the perks in her contract, it is up to $445,000. Fox 45 News has been asking you, do you trust Dr. Santalisis to lead Baltimore City Schools? 320 people voted, 96% said no, 4% or 13 people said yes. That brings us to our question of the day. Should parents be given school choice if their child's school is failing? Well, so far, 92% of those who voted say yes. Head to foxbaltimore.com slash vote to weigh in. If you have concerns about education you want your local representatives in Annapolis to address, scan that QR code right there on your screen. It will take you directly to our website, which lists their official email and phone numbers. Developing right now, the United States military has shot down another object, this time over Lake Huron. This happened late Sunday afternoon. That makes the third unidentified object brought down in as many days. On Saturday, an American fighter jet shot down an unidentified object over northern Canada. And on Friday, an unidentified object was shot down over Alaska. It comes one week after fighter jets brought down a Chinese spy balloon off the coast of South Carolina. And tonight, there seems to be some disagreement in Washington over what to do next. Sinclair National Correspondent Christine Frizzell has the story. Two, one, action. Another day, another U.S. military mission to bring down a flying object over North American airspace, including Sunday over Lake Huron, as well as Friday over Alaska, then assisting Canada in taking down one on Saturday. It represented a reasonable threat to civilian aircraft. Uh, so I give the order to take it down. The quick responses, though, followed a slower one. The initial spotting of what was deemed a Chinese surveillance balloon allowed to float across the country for days until it could be safely shot down over water. They do appear somewhat trigger happy, although this is certainly preferable to the permissive environment that they showed when the Chinese spy balloon was coming over some of our most sensitive sites. The incidents amplifying political differences between Democrats and Republicans, as well as the rocky U.S.-China relationship. This administration thus far hasn't uh, set a very good example of standing up to China. And the fact that he doesn't acknowledge the fact that uh, what is happening here is alarming and puts our nation in peril uh, it, it is itself alarming. Um, you know, we don't exactly have the A-team in place right now, which is also more than unfortunate. Even some Democrats calling for more transparency from the White House. I have real concerns about why the uh, administration is not being more forthcoming with everything that it knows. But Congressman Jim Himes and others acknowledge there is a lot that just isn't yet known, including what these latest objects even were, what countries they were from, and if we're finding more because there are more, or we're simply just now looking for them. Congress should look at that. That's the question we have to answer. Why, as far back as the Trump administration, did no one know about this? Answers for now still being located. The week ahead just as likely to bring far more uncertainty. A new normal for now, unable to escape the political blame game. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting. A group of juveniles is accused of armed robbery while a 14-year-old recovers from a gunshot wound. A look at the state of juvenile justice ahead of a big decision in Annapolis.
Maryland Republicans are working to curb crime in Baltimore and beyond the bills they're introducing and what the future could hold for them. And after a very chilly and rainy Sunday and Sunday night, it looks like a big turnaround in the weather pattern coming for the early week. I'm going to let you know how warm your Monday and Tuesday are going to be coming up in my weather authority forecast. Tomorrow, the state or the Senate, the state Senate executive nominations committee will hold a confirmation hearing for Governor Wes Moore's pick to lead the Department of Juvenile Services. It's Vincent Schraldi. Now, some are raising concerns about that pick. Critics point to his writings on not prosecuting people until they're at least 21 years of age. Fox 45 News asked City State's Attorney Ivan Bates about juvenile justice and Mr. Schraldi's take on that topic. He says he wants to know where everyone stands. That's something I feel the state's attorney's office really need to understand and know because I would like to have that nominee define, you know, how he, what he views as violent, what he views as nonviolent. Because I think that would allow me to have a better understanding in terms of the mindset of way he's looking at the law. I recognize some of these writings were in New York, some of them also down in Washington, D.C. I heard some very positive things, and I've also heard some other things that are, do, are a little concerning. But I'm also a big believer in that. The governor went did his due process, and this is who the governor wants. Well, the confirmation hearing comes on the heels of a violent few hours in some parts of Baltimore City. Four people were shot this weekend, two of the incidents involving juveniles. And police say a group of juveniles robbed a man, then shot him in southeast Baltimore. Then police say a 14-year-old girl was shot in the leg. They say she was playing with a gun with two other juveniles when she was shot. The other two children then ran away. Meanwhile, the House will hold a hearing on Wednesday on a bill City State's Attorney Ivan Bates is backing to toughen penalties for some gun crimes. Now, Republicans are introducing more bills to tackle crime. The No Bail for Violent Offenders Act, the Juvenile Gun Off Offense Accountability Act, and the Gun Theft Act. Republicans say the bills are an effort to get tough on crime. Lockdown crime policies that have been passed in Annapolis over the last few years have resulted in hundreds and hundreds of deaths of innocent people. Well, political analyst John Deedy says he believes most of the Republican efforts will stumble along party lines. He says he believes the only bill that will move forward is the one the city state's attorney is pushing. I think the problem with the bill is it's a good bill. The problem is it's been introduced by a Republican. And in Annapolis, the Democrats control things. They may cherry pick a little bit out of the bill, put it in the Senate Bill 889. But for the most part, I don't see it really getting anywhere as far as getting a hearing, et cetera. Now, you can find more on Republicans' proposed crime bills on our website, foxbaltimore.com. All right, late night travels. You're going to have to make sure you take it slow and easy, maybe heading home from those Super Bowl parties. We've got Westminster, Manchester, West Mannheim, some rain coming down. Still pretty good here over the northern Baltimore County as well as eastern Carroll County line up toward Manchester and uh, well east of Westminster right now. A little bit of a break here in the city and then some more showers as you head down toward Annapolis and Route 50 as well as you cross the Bay Bridge here onto the eastern shore. But overall, the back edge of the rain, it is coming. You can see it kind of pinwheeling gradually south and east and I think by about 2, 3 in the morning, things will begin to dry out. Take a look at some of these rain totals anywhere between about an inch and a half to two inches of rain north of the city, about a half inch of rain not too far uh, from Conkeysville as you work your way westbound toward uh, places like Eldersburg and then here in the city anywhere right around a half an inch of rain today. Temperatures right now at 40. Ugh, not very nice. Winds out of the north northwest at 14, making it feel like 32. But the good news is, again, we've kind of reduced to just cloudy skies on the Toyota H2 to Harbor Sky Cam. And that means some better news for the morning commute. Now, I do want to call your attention to the fact that temperatures, especially north the west, are a couple of degrees cooler than everybody else, although not at freezing toward morning, especially bridges, ramps, and overpasses as we keep a little bit of moisture around on some of those areas. 
there potentially could be a couple of spots of uh, kind of ice forming, a little bit of black ice. So keep that in mind. Take it slow and easy. Treat anything wet north and west uh, as potentially icy heading into work and school early tomorrow. Otherwise, there's a clearing line well to our west. Western Maryland already starting to see the starlight come out. Rain, even some mix over portions of the Appalachians today, but that all moving east, nicer weather. And you wait till you see here what happens tomorrow. It is going to be a huge change and a huge change in the way you dress. Take a look. Galoshes weather moves out tonight after about 3 a.m. or so. We'll see that last band of rain uh, beginning to sink down to the south and east, starting with that chill, maybe near freezing north and west. But how about this? By about 8, 9 o'clock, we're warming up, and it looks like we're back well into the, that's right, 50s tomorrow afternoon. Tonight, 34, rain ending, clearing toward daybreak. Again, watch out for some black ice north and west. 58 degrees with sunshine for tomorrow continues on Tuesday, 66 Wednesday. Slim chance of a shower. Showers develop Thursday into Friday, much cooler Friday. Cool down Saturday, back well into the 50s again though by Sunday Valentine's Day gorgeous with highs in the 50s. Jonathan thanks Baltimore County Police giving an update on the officer heard in last week's manhunt. The questions we still have about that incident still ahead. The COVID pandemic is creating new questions over media policy and medical policy. We'll have a look at the debate over medical freedom in tonight's full measure report. People in Baltimore County and beyond are rallying around the police detective at Shock Trauma after the more than 36 hour manhunt that spanned two counties last week. This GoFundMe page for the injured officer has raised more than $100,000 in just one day. Baltimore County Police say today Officer Chi is recovering and alert and in good spirits. And you can find a link on the GoFundMe page on our website, foxbaltimore.com slash newslinks. And police say this man, 24-year-old David Linthicum, shot two police officers in two days last week. It all started when police say officers responded to Linthicum's home on Wednesday after a call for somebody in crisis. Charging documents revealed David Linthicum's father let officers into the family home in Cockeysville, concerned his son was suicidal. The charging documents say officers found Linthicum holding a high-powered rifle. They say he then fired 15 rounds, hurting one officer, eventually getting away. That officer has been released from the hospital. More than 24 hours later, the documents reveal Linthicum was spotted a few blocks from his family home. The documents say the officer approached Linthicum when they say Linthicum shot the officer and then stole his car. It started out as a routine call, and now we're looking at two officers shot two days in a row. I can't think. I've worked uh, here for 35 years. I can't think of a time where something like that has happened before. Well, the officers arrested Linthicum eight hours later in Harford County. He's facing several charges, including attempted murder. He's being held without bail. And it is still not clear how Linthicum was able to get away from police on Wednesday. Fox 45 News will continue to follow the story in the days ahead. Stay up to date on air and at foxbaltimore.com. Well, setting up kids for success in school. Still ahead, why one group says it starts at bedtime. Well, with the worst of the COVID pandemic in the rearview mirror, there are lingering policy questions that will be addressed for years to come. And during COVID, thousands of people with legal prescriptions found their medicine blocked by the local pharmacy. Today, Full Measures' Cheryl Atkinson explores both sides in a debate over medical freedom. In October of 2021, Bill Salir and his wife got seriously ill with COVID. When they couldn't get treated quickly in person, they were among the millions who consulted a doctor online. I had a 50-50 shot of coming back out. The doctor's recommended treatment included steroids, vitamin D, and ivermectin, an FDA-approved drug long used in people and even longer in animals to fight worms and parasites. Just two months earlier, an analysis in the American Journal of Therapeutics looked at 15 studies and concluded that 
Ivermectin reduced the risk of COVID death and large reductions in COVID-19 deaths are possible using Ivermectin. But the reviews and messaging on Ivermectin were mixed. CDC issued a warning saying the drug could make some people seriously ill. In the small town of Albert Lee, Minnesota, where the Saliers live, two pharmacies refused to fill the Saliers Ivermectin prescription. That included the local Walmart. He talked to my wife and I heard her say, you can't do that. You can't just not fill a prescription because you feel like you don't want to. So you Bill Salier to says he turned to desperate Walmart measures. He consulted their doctor and their veterinarian, translated the horse formulation into a human dosage, and... We squirted horse paste into applesauce and down the hatch it went. Eight hours later, I walked out of the bedroom for the first time. And my children cheered. It was remarkable. I, I could tell I was winning. Salir felt so strongly about his experience, he sued Walmart and the grocery store. The judge dismissed the case. Salir is appealing. Walmart declined our interview request but told Full Measure, our pharmacists have exercised their professional judgment and we stand behind them. Has something like this happened before on this scale? To my knowledge, no. Andrea Sikora is a highly credentialed intensive care pharmacist who says the unprecedented prescription rejections were proper. I think that there is sometimes a misconception that you're going to go in and get this prescription filled and the pharmacist's job is really just to make sure that the correct pills are in the correct bottle and they go to you. Many pharmacies did fill ivermectin prescriptions. One of them told Full Measure that he examined the many studies, believes ivermectin is effective against COVID, and that his own family has taken it. My wife and I did the pony paste, and I, I believe I am here because of that decision. We ask, but nobody from the government is tracking the number of people supposedly helped or hurt by ivermectin and other such therapies. For Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Atkinson. And you can watch Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson Sundays on Fox 45 at 10 a.m. Earlier today, Urban Strategies hosted the second event of their pilot program, Bedtime in a Box at Port Discovery. Yeah, dozens of children received packages filled with reading activities and supplies to help set up their bedtime routines. Organizers say the goal is to set kids up for success at school. We're just trying to create just a whole 360 support for families. So the parents get these packs that they can do at home. The Port Discovery is a fun outlet for the kids. And then in the intermediary, we check in to see how school's going overall. Because we just want to try something crazy in hopes that it ensures that our readers are entering school ready and excited. Well, they will with this, with this group of uh, packages. Each package, by the way, includes books, pajamas, learning games, and much more. I think I saw a toothbrush, which is perfect. Yes, little... that's important to have. Yeah, exactly, before bed. Well, that's all <laughs> the news at 10 or whatever time whatever it is. Time I'm is. Mary Bubala. And I'm Kai Jackson. Thank you for watching. Here's Morgan Adson and Rocco DeSangro with Sports Unlimited. 1224, Mary, that's what time it is. Come up tonight on Sports Unlimited. That's a wrap on the 2022 NFL season. Yeah, happy Monday. We break down the Chiefs Super Bowl 57 winning performance. Ravens defensive end Calais Campbell making some news on Super Bowl Sunday. Campbell has his answer for year 16 or retirement. The coaching carousel continues in the NFL. The effect a potential move by the Colts might have on the Ravens search for their next offensive coordinator. And Maryland's leading scorer Diamond Miller joins us one on one. How Miller's best season in College Park almost didn't happen. Sports Unlimited starts after this. What's going on, everyone? Welcome into this late, late edition of Sports Unlimited. She's Morgan Adson. I'm Rocco DeSangro. The 2022 NFL season, it's officially in the books with the Kansas City Chiefs 
hoisting the Lombardi Trophy in the desert tonight. Good for them, of course. The rest of us, these hours after Super Bowl 57 are officially the worst because no more football until the fall. Before we get to the big game, though, big news for the Ravens 2023 roster. After taking some time to think about retirement for another offseason, veteran defensive end Calais Campbell plans to play another season. Campbell told the NFL Network during his media work at Super Bowl 57 today, quote, Coming back, baby. The 36-year-old is set to enter year 16. He's coming off a five-and-a-half sack season. Campbell is chasing a ring, potentially with the Ravens, and one more sack for a career total of 100. Campbell has a salary cap hit north of $9 million, so that needs to be tweaked with the Ravens' Lamar Jackson contract situation. In the next 48 hours, all the coaching dominoes will fall. Coaches on the Eagles and Chiefs are free to interview. One already has a job on lock, and it will potentially affect the Ravens' offensive coordinator search. The Colts are set to hire Eagles OC Shane Steichen as their next head coach, the D on the Ravens' radar for their offensive coordinator opening. So Maryland dominated the opposition last week, rolling over Northwestern and number 10 Ohio State. If the Terps keep playing like that, they're going to be a tough team to beat in March. Senior day in College Park, Terps honoring four of them. Cheyenne Sellers, she's only a sophomore, but had a solid game. 13 points for her. Senior Abby Myers, she dropped 18, but nobody shined brighter than Diamond Miller. 31 points, nine rebounds. She led the way in Maryland's 82-71 to 71 win. Speaking of, stay or leave, those options haunted Maryland guard Diamond Miller last offseason. While she was recovering from a sweet 16 loss and knee surgery, she watched the entire starting lineup around her leave in the transfer portal. Miller thought about leaving, had all kinds of tempting opportunities, but chose to stay. With more, here's the Terps Gym one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, it was very hard. I mean, I was going through my own things. I literally got surgery April 7th, and people, my friends, were telling me they were leaving. So it was just a lot to take in. I was like, I need to breathe. Like, just coming back from injury, I knew I had to come back, be healthy. Then I was thinking about what school is like, where should I go? Is this the school still for me, or do I need to look elsewhere and stuff like that? So it was. It was a lot. It's almost like she had to re-recruit you a little bit, which is fair. It's just the way that the game is now. What was it about this program, the uncertainty, but you being here at Maryland and wanting to have your senior year here? Yeah, you know, it's funny that you say, like, this university and stuff like that, because that has something to do with it, but it was more like myself. I wanted to prove something for myself that I could come back from this injury and be better than I was before. And it just happened that I stayed, but... I feel like I'm true talent and I feel like if I were to leave or not, it would have been the same. But I knew that I had a coach that trusted my abilities and knew me for three years. So it just made sense for me to stay. It's Maryland. There's always great players. Any night can be somebody's night. You guys still have that kind of roster, but you're the headliner. Was that important to you to, to be able to, to run the team and to kind of be the one and to elevate your game on that national level? Um, it definitely crossed my mind, you know, staying. I knew a lot of great of my a lot of great players were leaving, so I knew that if I stayed, what would the team be? So I definitely thought I def I definitely thought about that, but I just knew that I had a chance to do something big here, and I was really excited for that. There's more smiles from you. There's more audible screams of joy, and you're flexing. The tongue's coming out a little bit. What's it like to show that personality? Um, yeah, that that's me, you know, that's me at my best as me being confident in who I am and my abilities. And that's what I like to feel on the court. I like that feeling, you know, and that's why I work so hard for those feelings and stuff like that. You guys have a top 10 ranking. You're running through top 10 teams, destroyed Ohio State by 36 points. That's a record setting performance by Maryland over a top 10 team. What do those moments mean like when you're in February and know that March is around the corner? Um, yeah, it's super special, especially for the team to have the confidence to know that we could compete for a national championship is great motivation for us. And winning that game uh, truly helped, but we got to stay humble. Um, every night we could get beaten, and it's been proven by this team that we could lose to any team if we don't play the right way. So we know how to win and we know how to lose, and now we got to continue to execute the game plan every time we step on the court. Only four games left in the regular season. It feels like it went like that. Honestly, it really <laughs> did. What is it like to know that those dreams and, and that next step of reaching those dreams is around the corner? It's super exciting. I know, like, 
we love college, but nobody wants to stay forever. <laughs> it's been a journey, but you know, there's also another step that I'm thinking about. But I know I have my one year left, but we'll see. You're talking about the WNBA, which I'm sure you're hearing that buzz. Has that been a dream of yours? And when did you realize that could be a reality? Honestly, I never realized it could be a reality until like I came to college. Like in high school, I always like even in the recruitment process, I was always like, yeah, I want to go pro not really understanding what that meant or how much hard work it takes. So like freshman year was a bit of a struggle, but then when I realized I want to fully commit to this game, that's when I realized I wanted to go pro. So definitely in college. Towson back at home taking on UNC Wilmington Tigers, led by one at the half. 21st game for Kylie Cornegay Lucas scoring in double figures. She had 13, Patricia Anumba added eight as Towson Goes on to get the win, 60 to 44, the final score. Well, it's a new era of Johns Hopkins women's lacrosse that's underway with Tim McCormack's head coaching debut and with the Blue Jays dub. Luke Jones from WNSC joins us one on one to try to unpack the million or $45 million question this offseason. What's going to happen with the Ravens and quarterback Lamar Jackson? We'll be back in two minutes. After 29 seasons as the head coach of Johns Hopkins women's lacrosse, Janine Tucker announced her retirement. Her successor, two-time Pac-12 Coach of the Year, Tim McCormack. Blue Jays looking to get their new head coach a win in his debut, and they did just that. Georgie Gorlick led the way with five goals, while Ava Angelo added a hat trick as the Blue Jays get the win in their season opener, 17-10, the final score. Now with the Super Bowl all wrapped up, all teams are on to the offseason. The Ravens have had a head start in that, but still no change with their biggest question this offseason, Lamar Jackson's contract situation. To unpack this all and how it truly impacts every single move made by the Ravens in 2023, Luke Jones from WNST joins me one-on-one. -on -one. Like any offseason, lots of questions. The salary cap plays into that. None bigger, and I know everyone's tired of hearing about it. It's been two years strong, but Lamar Jackson, this is the biggest question, not only for the future of this offense, but for this immediate future of what they're going to do to build a roster. How do you see this playing out? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. I don't know. As time goes on, and I understand fans have been frustrated and you know, haven't wanted it to be a story and, and people are media are dwelling on it so much, but you just said it. It's the biggest story surrounding the Baltimore Ravens until it's not anymore. I mean, everything they do this offseason from uh, the, the ongoing offensive coordinator search to how much cap space they're going to have, uh, going to build the rest of their roster, long-term roster building in terms of is he playing on the tag this year? Uh, what does that mean for next year? Is it a long-term agreement at some point in time? And what does that mean in terms of future cap numbers? So there's just so much going on. Uh, I've said from probably the last few weeks of the season as you know, we were talking about his knee and whether he's going to come back and play in the playoffs or not, but I'm really in the mode at this point to expect anything. The longer it goes, does it say anything about this relationship and how kind of the end of the season played out and him releasing his injury information? Not sure if he's going to be on the field. The Ravens kind of seemed on the outside of knowing. Do you feel like there is some damage to the relationship between the two sides? I mean, I don't know if I'd call it damage, but I just, you have to wonder after two years of this, and, I, and let's be clear, when we say two years, it hasn't been two years straight. It's been lots of on again, off again. Sure. Uh, so, but how can there not be some semblance of questions of trust, right? Yeah. You know, you, you really do wonder and you know, just how it played out, who's really giving in at this point. And, you know, if, if you're the Ravens, a fully guaranteed deal now, Lamar's missed a, a you know, roughly a third of the last two seasons combined right. because of injury. It's where you just look at this thing and say something has to give at some point in time. And maybe it's the tag. Maybe it's even just shopping him for a trade and, and he can see what his value is to some point uh, with other teams. And, and maybe they work something out at that point. I don't know. Uh, but it really is tough to, to look at this thing and, and keep asking yourself how much longer can this continue without something giving. Let's play the if game with the tag. The window opens the 21st, closes March 7th to get that done. I do think that's the route they're going just to not let him go to the open market. If they tag him and he plays under the tag this season, the 45 million ish exclusive, what does that do to the salary cap and roster this season? 
I mean, it just makes things very difficult, Morgan. I mean, you look at where they are right now. They're roughly, if you look at the projections, and, and there are always some elements of that that's a little bit of unknown, but I know overthecap.com is a good source, and you know, $27, $28 million is what their projected space is now, and that's without Lamar accounted whatsoever. You're talking about having to make some moves and some cuts, which, you know, some of the names that have been floated out there, you know, I'm not talking out of turn here. I mean, Clayus Campbell's got a high cap number. You know, we don't, we don't even know for sure if he's going to play uh, in 2023, as he talked about it, you, know, you have guys like Chuck Clark and Gus Edwards and, you know, even a Michael Pierce who, who missed most of last season. I mean, there are ways to create cap space by either cutting some of those aforementioned individuals or reworking some deals. If you have to place the exclusive tag on him and he plays on the tag, or if this even if this plays out and, and let's say they strike a long term deal, you know, by the mid-July deadline. Okay, that's great for Lamar's future, but still makes things difficult in terms of how you want to build this roster. Let's go the if they tag him and trade him route. You know the value is going to be there because they're not going to give him up for free and they can get that cheaper, maybe a rental veteran for one season and then draft a project and have them on their rookie deal for potentially five years like they did Lamar, never have to pay him. If that happens, if what does that mean for the Ravens front office that they let a talent like that go and couldn't get a deal done? Well, uh, it means this, you better draft the next franchise quarterback and not the next Kyle Bowler. Because I mean, when you talk about that, I mean, it, it's not just what it means for the team on the field and the ramifications for that from the fan base, but you're talking about a very popular individual. If you are the Ravens, you can even maximize whatever hypothetical value you're going to get, but until you get that replacement and I'm sorry, it's not Ryan Tannehill. It, it, it's not, you know, it, it's not Jacoby Brissett. I mean, yeah, you can do a bridge quarterback scenario. I'm not saying what you said is even what wouldn't happen, but not winning a Super Bowl with those kind of guys. Your website is baltimorepositive.com. So let's be positive in, in this one. They they crush OC. They, they get him in. It's great. Everything's They've got Lamar under the long term. Steve Bashotti has been very friendly and generous with a lot of guaranteed money, and it's a friendly cap hit. Where does the number one focus then turn for the Ravens this offseason? How many years have we been talking about wide receiver? Going back to post-Super Bowl 47, going back to, you know, right around 10 years ago when the, the Ravens were signing Joe Flacco and then trading Anquan Bolden, what, three weeks later or right. whatever it was. And so, spend it too. Don't draft it. You know what I mean? Like, that's what yeah. needs to happen. I mean, that's what's tough. I, I mean, th this, is, this is what's tricky because, again, under your scenario, long-term deal, that means Lamar's cap number is probably much more flexible. So... Go out and get De DeAndre Hopkins or, I mean, Mike Evans has been mentioned, and, you know, I, although I still think Tampa Bay could try to extend him more than, than looking to trade him, but uh, it would be wide receiver. But I, I would say, and, and this is where I look at that first round pick, you know, I'd like to see an established receiver if you can make it happen, but don't sleep on corner. Uh, right. You have Marlon Humphrey, that's great. You know, Kyle Hamilton played in the slot. We'll see if that continues this year or he moves to a more conventional safety role. But either way, you know, unless Marcus Peters is willing to give you a very team friendly deal, uh, I think you need to be looking at finding a starting caliber outside corner. All right, Luke Jones from WNST. That's a lot of questions. And so far, not a lot of answers because <laughs> not to be dramatic, it all depends on Lamar Jackson. And we'll see that shake out soon. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Morgan. Glad to, ha glad to be on. Great interview there from Luke. Uh, an unlikely hero stepped up in a big way for Mount St. Joseph Wrestling. Why the sophomore is our Prep Player of the Week coming up next. Uh, Mount St. Joseph Wrestling has a number one next to its name for a reason. But last Thursday, that ranking was in jeopardy. That was until one sophomore, Brandon Beal. He stepped up in a big way against number two, South Carroll. And for that, he's our Prep Player of the Week. Big win for you guys over South Carroll uh, last week. Clap it up for yourselves for that. <laughs> Louder, come on, come on. There we go, there we go. Uh, and, and a big part of that when you had a sophomore, I, I think his name's Brandon Beal. He might be standing right here. Is that, is that Brandon? Where's Brandon at? Yeah. Uh, coming in, first varsity match, first varsity win. Uh, and for that, Brandon, you are our prep player of the week. So congratulations to you, my man. It, it was pretty nerve-wracking. Uh, I was nervous going into it in my first uh, varsity match of the season. So, yeah, it was definitely nerve-wracking, but I was excited. He's been working his tail off. Uh, he's been a couple years in the room with us. Uh, been really working really hard on the JV team, which obviously elevated him to wrestle varsity for us that match. Um, High-pressure moment, and he, he lived up to it. That he did. Beal took the mat with the Gales trailing 25-18. to 18. 
And with a pin 23 seconds into the second period, he was able to cut the Cavaliers lead to one. With South Carroll forfeits at 220 and 285 shortly after, Mount St. Joseph would go on to get the 36 to 25 win. In the moment, it was a little uh, iffy about like uh, me realizing how big this match might have been and meant to coach. And so, yeah, once I realized that, I was I was going to go out there and win. It was tremendous. Obviously, we knew our upper weights were pretty good, um, but we knew that was the pivotal match in the moment, especially with how everything kind of shook out during the dual meet. Uh, everyone knew, we knew, their team knew that was the critical match. And while Beal stepped up individually, he will be the first person to tell you he could not have done this on his own. Coach Barnaby and all the wrestlers, uh, I mean, they were supporting me before my match. And it's, I mean, it's a family, so. Congratulations to the Mount St. Joseph Gales on the big win and to Brandon Beal on being named our Prep Player of the Week. The Prep Player of the Week is provided by Allogram, your trusted source for awards. Big congrats to Brandon again to nominate a Prep Player of the Week. Send me an email, reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter with the name. That's all for Sports Unlimited tonight. For Rocco DeSangro, Morgan Atzit, thanks for watching. Good night.